friends, welcome to another episode of Making Disciples. Now this week we're going to jump straight in. We've got an interview with Nick Page. Uh, Nick is a historian, is a writer, and he's written a lot over the years about the Bible. And he writes from a really interesting point of view. Now Nick firmly believes the Bible is the, one of the centerpieces of our Christian faith, but he's so good at just questioning and asking the questions of this book that help us understand it a little bit more. So let's jump in straight away with this interview with Nick Page on the Bible. Nick Page, welcome to uh, Making Disciples. Thank you so much for spending this time with us. Uh, I've been uh, reading your books for a number of years now, right the way back. You got the Bible Atlas, you wrote the Bible book, and now you've brought out the badly behaving bible and this is really new can i start by asking you why why did you call it the badly behaved bible is it really badly behaved well uh, what happened is this um i get um i go and speak at a number of places and do all kinds of things and people come up to me and they go i've got this question about the bible or, i've got this problem with the bible and firstly they act as though you know that this is something really bad that there's something you know they, they shouldn't even be questioning it and secondly they you know that they, they, they've tried to talk about it, they can't find answers or whatever and and the thing is that um when you talk to them the problem is not normally with them and it's not normally with the bible it's really with what they've been told about the bible mm. so they've been misinformed about what the bible is and so the idea behind the book is that the bible will not conform itself to you know the way we misdescribe it so if you talk about the bible as you know um, you know, without contradiction, or you talk about it as as if God somehow typed it and delivered it on a on a an, in a jiffy bag to the desk of St Paul. You know, or you talk about it as a book of rules, or all these ways that people talk about the Bible. They're trying to get at something, but they're not, in fact, what the Bible is. Yeah. So, Bible is badly behaved because it's the enemy of you know a lot of the ways in which we try to categorize it. It keeps it keeps confounding that. The minute you try and put it in a box, it jumps out of it. Yeah, so how would you describe the Bible? For you, what, what, what is this book? I, uh, well, I wouldn't even necessarily now just describe it as a book. I mean, I know it looks like a book. Yeah. Because it's got lots of pages and it's, uh, and it's in, 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 the, in between the covers. But, but I like to view it as a place of encounter. I think when you read the Bible, what makes the Bible different is that God, uh, God's life, God's breath speaks. Through it. That's what the word inspired. Sometimes people use that word about the Bible. They, they say it's inspired. There's a Greek word that, that Paul uses, which is theopneustos, which means God breathed. Mm. And it's like the breath of God is in this book. So I think I prefer to view the Bible as holy ground, as a place of encounter. You go to the pages of the Bible. You don't know what's going to happen there. You don't know what God is going to say to you. And, it, you know, sometimes he's, sometimes nothing happens at all. Sometimes you read things that just completely baffle you and you have no idea what, what to do with them. But sometimes something just leaps out at you mm. and the whole thing comes alive. So I, I, I prefer that metaphor of the Bible as a place to encounter God. Mm. So how would you approach the Bible then? How would you read the Bible? If somebody hasn't started reading it yet mm. or somebody who struggles reading it, what, what would be your tips? Well, um, and tip number one is open it, you know, because that's <laughs> we just look at it. And we walk around it and, you know, we edge around and we carry it. Sometimes some of us carry it around with us, but we don't open it because it's slightly scary. Uh, it seems it's so big. It's so old. It's uh, complicated at points. Um, so just don't be scared of it. Open it. I think too often we turn Bible reading into some kind of extreme sport, you know, through the Bible in a year as if <laughs> as if you're doing a marathon. I, I don't hold on any of those things, really. I think you can take as long as you like to read as little as you like. My wife was reading it through a year, through the year a couple of, um, well, a little while ago. And she said, I'm going to do it. And I said, OK. And um, it got to about February. And I said, how are you doing? She said, I've got Levitical exhaustion. Basically, because she's got one of those bits in a book called Leviticus, which is fairly hard going. It's a lot of law. You know, she just got bogged down. It's, it's not an endurance sport. I'd love to ask you some problem questions. And you talk about this in the book, but I'd love you just to share. Firstly, we often hear, uh, well, the Bible wasn't given to us as a book. How do we really know how we got the Bible? You know, how do we really know that this is what should be in the Bible? How was the Bible put together? Um, uh, really by the church. 
and um, by the church I mean the early community of believers uh, uh, in in the first sort of four centuries really and before that obviously by uh, the Jewish community of believers so we have two sections of the Bible what, we, what Christians tend to call the Old Testament which I don't think is a particularly helpful um, categorization actually but it's basically the Jewish scriptures and then Christian scriptures which are sort of added on later and it came about because groups of believers got together and said we believe these are the authoritative books so for the Jewish scriptures that um, the first five books of the Bible the what's known as the Torah became accepted very early on they're the kind of bedrocks of it other books took a lot longer to become incorporated and in the end um, the tradition is that a group of rabbis got together in um, uh, a place called Jamnia in about 90 AD and sort of finalized the list and they were going through some there were some difficult bits there were some difficult books that didn't almost didn't make it in I'm very glad they did the books like Ecclesiastes uh, uh, Ecclesiastes because it's it, it reads like it's written by a particularly depressed art student. Uh, you know, uh, Esther, because it doesn't mention God. Ezekiel, because it's it's a bit wacko at points. You know, there are all these books. But in the end, they decided that this was what's called the canon, which is a, a word that comes from a, a Greek word meaning rule. Or, you know, it's kind of what measures up, as it were. And um, and, and that was decided. For Christians, it took a, a bit longer. They, they had the Jewish scriptures to start with. So when Paul, for example, talks about scripture he's talking about um the jewish scriptures he's not talking about the christian bible and that took a while first the gospels were accepted probably about 100 ad 120 and then and then uh paul's letters and other letters and then you know there was a lot of debate going on but the point is that the church um looked at these books and said which of these books do we think has the breath of god which of these books do we think tell the true story which are authoritative and they base that on experience of a wide number of Christians, on the association of the books with historical figures as best they could understand it, with which ones they thought were the most credible and most accurate. Um, so it's it's actually a, a quite a human kind of um, process and a historically verifiable process. And I think that's how it works. So I think it's God. It's not to say that God's hand wasn't in that or that the inspiration of the Holy Spirit wasn't in that. It's the fact that it all works through human beings, through consultation, through 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 uh, wisdom, through people talking to one another, through human experience of things. Mm. That finally, says this is this is the collection. Yeah. But at no point did God issue a list. Yeah. He didn't do that. So often people ask me, well, what about the authority of the Bible? And I I, I want to say, well, it all depends on your view of the authority of the early church. You know, that's what it depends on. But that's how it happened. Yeah. And people come to you, don't they, and say, did you know there are books that weren't in the Bible? There's one called the Gospel of Thomas. Like there's these, these other stories that are around. Uh, why did they not make it in? What, 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 what was the thing yeah. that stopped some of them? There's a, a couple of reasons. Firstly, they were written generally a lot later. So people talk about what's called the Gnostic Gospels, basically. Gnostic is a word that comes from the Greek word gnosis, meaning secret knowledge, hidden knowledge. So these the Gnostics are a broad range of, of uh, believers, and they kind of, what they have in common is that they believe that some special revelation has come to them. There are levels of belief. You know, God is not going to reveal it all to the lower levels. You've got to ascend up. So there's stuff that he holds back that only the initiated, the enlightened can fully understand. So they created uh, works to sort of back up their mm. view. Um, and they're generally written a lot later. So the Gospel of Thomas from about, I don't know, 150, 170 AD onwards, we're not quite sure. That's the most famous one. Other Gospels, you know, um, later than that. So firstly, they're much later. Secondly, they're just a bit pants. You know, that was the other issue yeah. about it. I got accosted actually by buying a pair of shoes the other day. I was buying a pair of shoes and a bloke got chatty with me and he was saying, what do you do for a living? And I said, I, I, I write books. And he said, what do you write about? And I told him, I said, I write about first century history. I write about biblical history, I write about the Bible. And then he said to me exactly that. He said, yeah, ah, yes, I bet, I bet you don't write about this. I bet you don't. I bet you've never written about the Gospel of Thomas. And I said, well, I've written about it quite a lot, actually. And I've read it quite a lot. And he said, well, you know, why, why didn't it make it in the Bible? And I said, because it's a load of rubbish. 
and he was quite taken aback. And but it, it's, it's not quite entirely a load of rubbish because actually there may be stuff in the Gospel of Thomas that are genuine sayings of Jesus, but there are also bits that are clearly anti-Semitic and misogynistic, and and clearly nothing to do with Jesus. Yeah. So the church wasn't suppressing these because somehow they were the hidden truth. They were suppressing them because they knew where they'd come from, and and they weren't credible in their eyes. So that's why they don't get in. They can be of interest to us. There's some extra books as well. For example, uh, there's a book called the Didache, which is very interesting and good for this for your discipleship site because the Didache is means the teachings, yeah. and it's really the first sort of Christian discipleship manual. It's how to be a Christian, and it probably, in my opinion, it, it it dates back to well within the first century. I think it's really early, but it wasn't accepted as scripture because. Not because it said anything wrong or unorthodox, but because people didn't think that it actually was written by. They knew they knew where it came from. They didn't think that it was written by an apostle or anything like that. They kind of thought it's it. This is our manual. This is our instruction manual. It can teach us a lot about discipleship and a lot about the early church, but it never made it into the final thing because it wasn't seen as 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 being part of the corpus. So they kept out books which were, you know, clearly, in their views, not true. And they kept out books that actually were true and helpful, but were not seen as being God breathed in that way. Mm. Every family has somebody in it who's just a little bit odd. <laughs> and within the church, uh, with the wider early church, there were people who were a little bit odd. And it's purely their oddness that means that they got no, that actually where that's come from is not a place that we want to yeah. kind of yeah. make it orthodox. Yeah. Uh, they, and it's quite clear what they were doing. I mean, certain there's a book, for example, called The Acts of Paul and Thecla. And it's it's a it's like a, a rom com or it's like a romantic novel about Paul and this woman Thecla who kind of falls for him. And um, and it didn't get into the Bible. It's very influential, actually, very influential in the early church. People loved it. And, and, and but it didn't get into scripture because people knew who wrote it. They knew it was written by a guy, I think, in Alexandria. Who, who was just a big fan of Paul, and he just wanted to write some sort of fan fiction to carry on. So, you know, they're not stupid, these people. They can trace where things come from, and, and they're taking a considered decision. Uh, yeah. They're not made anything. You know, they're just trying to say, no, this this is the authoritative stuff. This is the stuff that uh, that really matters. Fan fiction is a good term. That has to be the, the best way of describing it. Next question for you. So uh, I often have people say God changes in the Bible, doesn't he, Chris? He starts as one person and ends very loving. He seems to go through a very hateful phase and then becomes loving at the end. Uh, does God change in the Bible? I would say uh, the pictures of God do change. Yeah, I think they do. I'm not sure you say God changes, but I say the way that people understand God changes. So this is the other thing people think about the Bible. They think the Bible is a manual of theology. That's what it is. It's, it's a theology's words about God. They think the Bible is this encyclopedia of all the right things to think. The Bible actually shows people doing the thinking. It doesn't show the finished product. Theology is what we do with the Bible. It's not actually, you know, what happens within. Well, sometimes it happens within the Bible, but it, but it's very, you know, they're they're learning, they're they're dealing with the raw material, the source material. So I think people's understanding of God changes within the Bible, and in fact, you can see that quite clearly. You can see it, for example, in the Psalms. Um, the Psalms are brilliant because the Psalms are. Um, a friend of mine says the Psalms aren't always right, but they're always true. In other words, they're not they're not saying the proper things, the things that you're supposed to say about God or about life. They're just saying the honest things. And they start off with with, you know, really orthodox things. So the orthodox thing is, uh, you know, if you're righteous, your life will go well. If you're a God fearing man, the life will go well. If you're an evil, it will go badly. That's how it is. So, that you know, the righteous people like big trees flowering and all that. Righteous, uh, uh, evil people, bad, ooh, naughty, you know, then. It starts to nuance slightly because somebody realizes that actually the unrighteous people are having quite a good time. And so it says, OK, if you're good, then, you know, you will eventually get blessed by God. Uh, and if you're bad, you might really have a good time. But the thing, bad thing will happen to you in the end. And then it goes even further because then they realize actually quite a lot of bad people. Nothing bad happens to them in the end. They seem to live quite a good life and die peaceably. 
So then what happens? So then they're going, okay, if you're good, then maybe there's an afterlife. Maybe there's that's best, best after that, and maybe something else happens. So in other words, there's all kinds of developing ideas of God going on. And you can trace these through the Psalms. You can trace it in a book like Job. If you read Job, which is an amazing book, and it's a book about a, man, a good man uh, does nothing wrong and terrible things happen to him. And that's the setup. And, the, and it's a way of discussing what suffering is. And in the end, the book, in fact, doesn't really answer the question because you can't really answer that question. But the interesting thing about Job is that, in part, it's critiquing other ideas in the Bible. So Job is a, is a critique of that idea that if you are righteous, then God you know, will bless you and everything will go well with you. You know, if you're a good man and you obey all the right and tick all the right boxes, then things will go well with you. And God, in the end, sweeps in at the end of Job and what he really criticizes are people who've been giving that theology. <laughs> he says, you know, you've been, you've been talking a lot of rubbish. Job has spoken truth. What Job has done is going, uh, accused God and said, why have you done this to me? So it's a more complex um, book than we think. It's showing people working out what they think about God. And sometimes that results in some pictures of God that I think are difficult for us and we have to grapple with. Well, it's partly, you know, when you're a child, you see your parents in a particular way. As you hit that eight, nine, ten year old, you see your parents in a different way. When you hit teenager, you see your parents in a different way. Then when you hit your 20s, your 30s, all the way through until they're in their 90s, you, you are always changing your view on your parents and you are realising things all along that were always there, but you maybe didn't see them or understand them in the way they needed understanding. And in the Bible, we've got the same thing going on, but the maturing is through humanity as we understand the, understand God. But it's not that God's changing, it's that we're changing and that the Absolutely. way we respond to him changes. So, you know, the way that works out is in the earlier parts of the Bible, God is almost like a tribal deity. Mm. He, first, he's a clan deity. First, he kind of like, he picks up on... Uh, Abraham is the patriarch of the, the people and his clan. And then he becomes a, a, a sort of a, a tribal kind of deity beyond that. And then he becomes a national deity of the Israel, Israelites, the Hebrews. And then they have a real shock because then he becomes a global deity. And they can't, sometimes that's really hard for them to cope with. And you get books like Jonah, which is a story about a man who cannot cope with the idea that God might like um, might want to forgive Israel's enemies. He might be their God as well. Uh, and so there's this big under, you know, change in understanding of, of exactly that. Who is God? What's the picture of him? And here, I don't think he's changed, but it's your lens through which you see him that changes. That's good. Okay, next question. Uh, is the Bible historically correct? Uh, ooh, well, it depends what you mean by correct. People ask me... Is true right so that's the thing that people ask and what they're thinking of obviously is things like the six day. you know was the world created in six days was jonah really swallowed by a fish these kinds of things did noah really put all the creation in an ark um so i'd want to say that firstly the bible is stories it's much more stories than anything else it's a whole mix of stuff it's there's all kinds of different writings in the bible um so i would say no the, the bible is not all historically literally true and, and the, the reason is, it's a very, and there isn't anyone who believes that. Nobody in the world believes the Bible is literally true. And so, because, because if, if it's literally true, there's a bit, for example, where Jesus says, I am the gate. So if it's literally true, at that point, Jesus was a small five bar wooden gate. If, if it's literally true, when Jesus says, I am the bread of life, he was a baguette at that point, or something like that. No, it's metaphor. We know that's not literally true. So, Obviously, there's poetry in there and stories and parables and, you know, lots of metaphors. So that's one thing. I think when people ask, is the Bible true? They mean, did it actually happen historically? Um, I would say the Bible is true, uh, but stories can be true in different ways. So I, in the Bad Behaved Bible book, I, I talk about the story of Chicken Licking. If you know the story of Chicken yeah. Licking, he believes the sky is going to fall on his head because an acorn falls out of the tree and hits him on the head. He goes, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. And he goes to Ducky Lucky and he tells Ducky Lucky, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. And Ducky Lucky goes to Turkey Lurkey. There's all these various fowl with strange names, you know, um, uh, organic chicken licking or something. I don't know. You know, uh, 
peasant, pheasant, I don't know. Anyway, the whole line of them, they all panic. And they're all saying the sky's falling. And they meet um, the fox who says, oh, that's very interesting. Come and tell me more about it. So they go tell me more about it and he eats them all. You know, that's how, well, that's how the story goes. Now, is, is chicken licking true? No, of course it's not true in the sense that chickens don't, on the whole, spread fake news. But it's true in the way that panic starts. It's all about gossip. It's all about fake news. It's all about the way that people get caught up in these things and the disaster that might overtake them if they believe just what somebody else has said. So, you know, the stories can be true on uh, can be true, but not actually have happened. So do I believe I don't personally believe that all the Bible is historically true. I don't believe Genesis, for example, is that kind of book. I think it's a book of stories, and those stories are very, very rich and very profound. But uh, personally, I don't have to, you know, believe it happened. I, I think with something like Jonah, the story remains the, the, tr the truth of the story, the meaning of the story remains the same, whether or not it's an actual happening or it's a, a, a story uh, written about a prophet called Jonah, a made-up story. What I would counter that with as well is that there were bits of the Bible, there are other bits of the Bible, quite a lot of the Bible, I believe is absolutely historically true because you can verify it from, for, or the background of it from mm -hmm. other um, uh, sources. And particularly when it comes to things like the Gospels, I've spent a lot of my career, what, la what I laughingly call my career, um, looking at the historicity of the Gospels. And those were written very, very close to the events they describe. So they're very different to something like Genesis, which was written a long way after. They're written in a different style. They're a different kind of writing. Um, so I, I, I think you have to take each part of writing on its own merits, really. I remember preaching when I was at college on the book of Job. And it was looking at the opening bit about God and the devil talking. I had this... My sermon was on, does God and the devil talk in that kind of way? And anyway, I remember, I had no idea what I said, but at the end of it, one of my lecturers came up to me and said, you do realise, Chris, the book of Job is like a Shakespearean play that was performed in the street. And each chapter, uh, um, somebody gets up and has a monologue and then they sit down and somebody else gets up. The whole thing is a street drama wrestling with who ultimately uh, can we blame suffering on and how powerful really is God? How caring really is God? And it was our whole street drama. And suddenly I said, well, it's obviously therefore not historically correct. And they looked at me and said, what are you talking about? It's a beautiful story that's meant to help us wrestle through the big questions. Did Job exist? Who cares? It's written yes. as something to help you explore. And then suddenly that all makes sense to me. The, the two God-given tools that we have curiosity to ask questions and and to you know it's often said your curiosity is looked down on it's kind of frowning you shouldn't ask questions curiosity killed the cat which explains why cats have never given us any real insights into life you know they, just, anyway no, it's but curiosity is where we get everything from asking questions about what what does this do what's over there behind that mountain you know what happens if i mix these two substances together Several people have asked that over the years, too. different effects. You know, curiosity is really important. What Job is a book that is about, you know, intense curiosity, curiosity driven by why have you done this to me? So perhaps curiosity is a bit too trivial a word for it there, but nevertheless questioning, doubt, you might say. Mm. Imagination is the other tool, which is what's the answer? What was it like to be there? What might be happening in this? What might God be saying to me here? Um, so, you know, yeah, I, I, I think it's an interactive process, this text. So another question then that I get asked quite a lot. I'm throwing at you all the questions that I get asked. I'm going to see if you come up with better answers. Um, <laughs> the Bible, it's changed in the last 2000 years from what was written to what we have now, hasn't it? It's different. It's a different book. It's been fiddled with. How true is that statement? Uh, not Not massively true. I mean... There are, okay, firstly, remember this, it's all in translation. Everything we have is in translation, well, unless you can read ancient Hebrew. But even the Greek, so Jesus didn't probably didn't speak Greek, he probably spoke Aramaic. So there's, it's, it's been a translation from the start. So we're always reading in translation. What changes quite often is the way that translators choose words. And as anybody knows who's done any translation, you know, the same word can have different meanings and both can be right 
and because you don't have the original author there it's hard to tell so sort of translations have changed over the years more uh, manuscripts have been found so we have a lot of fragments and manuscripts for example of the new testament books loads and loads of them and uh, what scholars try and do is get the most um, accurate version out of those manuscripts so they look for the earliest manuscripts and they see what they can find so that would be why some of the text has changed for example if you grew up with the king james version um you know it, it, some of the text has changed because the king james version was translated not using the earliest manuscripts in terms of the actual differences in in the text um yes there are differences because of all these sources that have been found but they're not major they're not massive there's nothing sort of earth shatteringly uh different um for example in the 50s they discovered um the dead sea scrolls which some people may have heard of which were discovered in a in a cave uh near Qumran, near the, uh, the shore of the dead sea in, in uh the west bank and um those had some differences. The manuscripts that were there, the biblical manuscripts that were there, had some differences with the accepted sort of Hebrew text. And so you have to kind of work out which is the original, which is the earliest, which is more authentic. Um, so there's always this textual thing going on, trying to work out what is most accurate. But I would argue that broadly that the text hasn't changed massively. A lot of it is in this translation, is it? One of the, the yep. bits I loved actually in your book you talked about the translation of the word toilet and ah. actually in the NRSV which is one of the translations of the Bible they want to use the word sewer not the word toilet uh, what's that about well you see that's the other thing translators are human and they are they are driven they have an agenda everybody has an agenda that sounds like I'm accusing them but everybody has an agenda everybody comes from a certain faith standpoint all right certain set of beliefs and so if you've got choices of how to translate something you might choose one way or you might choose another and uh, that may well be driven by some other ideas one of our ideas about the bible is that um you know, about jesus is that he 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 he's he's jesus what well, he's he's got so he's you can't have jesus doing things like talking about toilets that's not that's not right and so um, the word that Jesus uses means toilet or latrine, you know, it means pit, basically, that you pee into or whatever. But it's a toilet, as we would understand it. But because we don't want Jesus to use words like toilet, because that's very impolite, they tend to translate it as, um, yeah, sewer or just go into, onto the ground. You know, they, they, they make Jesus much more polite than he was. It's like and the that's... word scubalong. Uh, the word scubalong in the Greek often doesn't get translated as the forward S-H-I-T. It gets translated <laughs> as rubbish. Yeah. And yeah. it makes a difference to us because actually it takes the rawness away from yeah. what is a very raw book. And Paul particularly was quite potty-mouthed at times um, because his culture, his culture had no problem. I mean, basically, in Paul's culture, this is a culture where there are pots on the corner of every street that people to piss into so that they can, they can, uh, you might have to bleep that, but, you know, they can, they can, they um, can, uh, for, for the leatherworking trade. So nobody's shy about it. People aren't walking around in much clothing anyway. Nobody's, you know, coy about it. It's, it's us who are coy about it. Nick, thank you. I, Having read the book, um, I mean, I, I love the Bible. That's my, I wouldn't do what I do if I didn't love the Bible. But I think as I'm reading this, there were so many moments where I'm going, yes, yeah, somebody else is saying the same thing as me. And it doesn't, um, when you understand the Bible doesn't behave itself the way we want it to behave, it doesn't undermine it. Actually, it gives it greater credibility that this is real. Yeah. It's honest. It's real life. And it's God. You know, for me, this is a collection, not your book, but the Bible is a collection of writings where people have encountered God and some of them have just written it down. Yeah, and exactly. there's, a, there's a lot of things God did that hasn't been written down, but here are just a collection of things that people have written down. Yeah, and it's from their perspective and their understanding, and therefore the way we approach it as such is that we're learning from each other. It's not God saying this is as it is. Yeah, uh, but it's it's a group of people of faith all working out who is this God and how does He behave. And how do we relate to him and how does he relate to us? Nick, thank you so much for writing the book. Thank you for uh, doing the podcast as well, uh, Mid-Faith Crisis. Absolutely love it. 
Uh, and, and thank you for giving me time today to ask you some of these difficult questions. Um, really appreciate it. You're more than welcome. It's really nice to be with you. Bless you. Thanks, Nick. Thanks.